myself, we have uh, designed uh, this day of Impact Blockchain Conference with a lot of intention and vision to really link and connect sustainability web 2 and um, blockchain solutions. So you have a great panel of experts, amazing moderator, amazing facilitator. We wish you a very good panel discussion. Thank you very much, Jan. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, I'm very pleased to, to be here just to introduce myself. So I'm Raphael Bloch, one of the co-founder of the Web3 Media, uh, The Big Whale. We launched The Big Whale uh, one year ago. And uh, I'm very pleased to be here because we also decided to choose uh, The Big Whale uh, because maybe, as you know, a whale is a carbon retainer. So it was, from the beginning, a way for us to express that Climate change uh, is also a matter for, for, for journalists, especially in the Web3 ecosystem. And I'm very pleased to, to be uh, so with you, uh, for a great uh, panelist, to talk about a very specific but very interesting subject about so uh, market carbon, or carbon markets. And um, so we have Marcus Aurelius from um, uh, Clima DAO. We've got also Alejandra Verde Medina from Assess Ecological and Sustainable Services. We've got Guillaume Letty from Carbonable and also Aurélie Grange from Open Forest Protocol. Uh, I just would like you to introduce briefly yourself in 30 seconds, one minute, if it's possible. Sure. Hey, everyone. Great to be with you here in Paris. I'm a contributor at KlimaDAO. My day-to-day -day is mostly creating dashboards and maintaining data products, but I also spend a lot of time communicating about the project with lovely people like all of you. Um, my background is in data science and data engineering. Uh, I studied physics and philosophy in school, and I'm really excited to bring that technical skill set to bear on one of the most pressing problems of our generation, uh, the climate crisis. Uh, hello, I am Alejandra. Um, I work in ASSES. My background is in biology, so I work in the technical side of developing methodologies for assessing the beneficial impacts of uh, nature restoration projects. So we assess uh, carbon, soil, biodiversity, water benefits of the projects. Um, well, that's it <laughs> for the moment. Hello, my name is uh, Guillaume Lady, so I'm the co founder and CEO of Carbonable. Uh, Carbonable, we are a carbon contribution platform. Uh, so carbon contribution platform manager and what we do is we do it through blockchain our uh, our tool helps streamline the funding of carbon removal projects helps then manage the assets that are inherent from it helps monitor and helps report on those investments so our common goal let's say our vision and mission is really to elevate carbon investment and carbon management to a new standard of transparency, traceability, and operational efficiency. Background engineer and business. Hi, everybody. So I'm Aurelien. Um, my background is environmental engineering, co-founder and chief climate officer at Open Forest Protocol. And what Open Forest Protocol does is basically providing open, transparent MRV tools. So MRV stands for Measurement, Reporting, and Verification. We start with forest projects. We enable them to access also carbon financing and kind of have the same mission, like transparency, scalability, traceability of carbon forests all, all around the world. OK, perfect. And so when we worked for this, uh, this panel a few weeks ago, uh, we thought that it was a good idea just maybe to start with uh, a simple question, uh, what's the carbon markets and how it works uh, from uh, the Tokyo Protocol in 1997 back, I mean, uh, to 2023, maybe, Marcus, you can, you can start on this? Sure. So the fundamental premise of carbon markets is fairly simple. On one hand, there are organizations and individuals all around the world who have money and want to have a positive impact on the climate. On the other hand, there are people all around the world who are in a position to take positive actions that will either reduce ongoing emissions or remove carbon dioxide that's already been emitted. The mechanism of carbon markets connects that financing to the people on the ground who can go and take the positive actions. Those actions might be planting trees, installing renewable energy. There's a variety of different methodologies that can be used for reducing or removing emissions. And the, the concept goes back about 30 years to the Kyoto Protocol. And in particular, as part of that protocol, there were national commitments made by governments 
to reduce their emissions over time. And there was also a mechanism called the Clean Development Mechanism, or the CDM, that provided a global, uh, a global market for issuing and trading of carbon credits. And the carbon credits were designed in a way that any organization or individual that wanted to make claims about the extent to which they are supporting decarbonization of the energy grid, planting of trees, restoration of ecosystems, could make those claims in a verifiable way and get money to the people on the ground taking those actions. So it started uh, 25 years ago and yeah, today, Guillaume or Alejandra, I mean, how it's working, uh, especially maybe in France, Europe, and the road? I would, I would just specify one, one element because I think for many people it's actually quite confusing. There are two types of carbon credit markets, if we may say so. There is, and, and they, all, they both share the word carbon credit, so it's, or at, at least commonly, so it's pretty difficult to understand, but you have like, let's say the regulatory carbon market, which are now called carbon allowances. So that, is, that applies only to heavy polluters, so heavy polluter companies such as uh, plane, airplane company, etc. And they have like a cap and trade. So they have a cap, they cannot, if they go above, they have to buy carbon credits, and this way they, 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 are, they, are, they fit within the cap. So it's more so like the, the carbon credit in that context, carbon allowance, is more so like a punishment, is more so like a, an incitation for them to reduce emissions. The other one that I think like the majority of us, or all of us actually, are involved in are voluntary carbon credits that are now called carbon contributions. And um, those are actually in the, in, in the path to net zero. So companies really willing to go, like they reduce their emissions at the lowest uh, incompressible level that they can. So let's say, you know, they have humans working, they have, uh, um, you know, laptops, etc. It generates uh, CO2. They've reduced it to a maximum and then to counterbalance this amount, they then invest in carbon uh, contributions which are uh, the equivalent of one ton of CO2 absorbed or avoided in the atmosphere. So it was just to make the distinction because I know that in many heads, when you think of carbon credit, it's one. And now, the, so I think this is good that there, there, there are two names, carbon allowances and carbon contributions. Yeah, exactly. And so, I mean, what's the biggest so market between those two uh, nowadays? Well, I... Th do you want, oh, okay. I, well, the thing is, like the car carbon allowance is uh, much uh, older. It, gen it, is, it started actually five years after uh, the, the the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, prices are actually quite high. Uh, it's government based, so government impose companies, heavy polluters, to respect, and so they have no choice. Um, so obviously, like this this market is more both more ma mature and bigger. That said, now, especially in Europe, Europe has committed to carbon neutrality in 2050. Um, and, and so if they want Europe to be carbon neutral, they will, like, they're actually already putting in place laws for companies to go towards the net zero uh, goal, like, w like globally, like Europe based. So when law comes, obviously it accelerates. And so I think we're, and it's not, I think, like when you see Bloomberg, McKinsey, S&P Global, etc., the, the voluntary carbon market, like all the curves are like this, because it's like the predictions is, is that it's, it's going to increase by a factor of 10, 20, 50, up to 100. So we are at the beginning of a massive market. And Alejandra, I think that you are working on the voluntary carbon market, right? Can, can you maybe tell us a little bit more about it? Yes, sure. So the voluntary carbon market, as the name says, it's voluntary. Uh, the motivations for people to to go to it are uh, several. It can be from doing the right thing, like uh, survival. We everyone needs to do something, so uh, being responsible, trying to help the planet. Um, also for companies to to clean their image, to to go into the trend of now we are all eco-friendly, but not in the greenwashing aspect. It can be, it happens, but uh, ideally not like that. Um, 
also for companies that uh, their value chain is dependent on nature, which is 50% uh, of the global economy depends on nature. So, uh, for, for example, the agri-food system, it's better for them to have uh, healthy ecosystems, healthy soils, uh, to keep producing what they need, the raw materials for that. So it can go from individuals to companies to buy credits, uh, any amount of them and to support the projects they, they believe in, like either with social benefits, like cook stoves or uh, this kind of technology or restoration of ecosystems. So it's quite uh, big, the possibilities to support different projects and maybe we can go further into that later. Okay, yeah. and is it a worldwide uh, market or still a very national market? It's worldwide, but it's more focalized, the, well, the buyers are on developed countries and the projects are developed in developing countries because nature there is it maybe has more potential is more uh, flourishing but uh, for example now we in ASES we are developing projects in France as well okay. and in other European countries and there, is, there is actually one counter example which is France pretty much <laughs> like all like pretty much all certifiers standards they work worldwide in France, there is LBC, which is Label Bacarwen, and they're sort of saying like, you know, we are the only one uh, because it's government uh, related. So that's that's the only counter example that I have in mind. Like in all other countries, like you have like major standards, including Vera, Gold Standard, Plan A, uh, Plan Vivo, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, and and in France, you have Label Bacarwen, but specifically in France. Yeah. Okay, and Aurine, um I mean. Is this system uh, working? I mean, is it efficient uh, to work like this for uh, 20 years? I mean, every system has drawbacks. So it's a good start. Like, I think it's, it's an easy way to measure an impact. Carbon, basically. You have, like, you can measure it easily. It's fungible, so you can understand. You can measure how much carbon is ca captured or how much carbon is avoided. Um, but of course, it doesn't account for a lot of also like social benefits um, sometimes, or impact on biodiversity. So you can have very good projects um, that have a lot of co-benefits, but you can also have projects that have less co-benefits. And that, for example, if we take forests, just monocultures, which is not super cool for the environment, for the biodiversity, and so on. So it's not a perfect system, but it's a at least it's a system where we funnel funds towards um, reducing CO2 or avoiding the emissions of CO2. So I would say we can improve it, and that's why we're here. Um, it's also not very transparent nowadays. It's very siloed. Um, and this is what we're all working on, uh, increasing the transparency and so on, the, the access to the funds, um, the scale of the project, because we need way more projects. Um, so, yeah, go, go ahead, Marcus. Yeah, I just want to jump in with a sense of scale. The total amount of carbon credits ever issued to date is around 2 billion tons, whereas we've emitted about 2 trillion tons of carbon dioxide since the Industrial Revolution. And so Guillaume mentioned net zero and uh, the commitments that are being made now globally. And while uh, compliance systems like what exists here in the EU can force companies to reduce their emissions, they do nothing to address the carbon debt of two trillion tons that's already up in the atmosphere. So if we are going to manage the planet and keep global warming below, pick your target, 1.5 C or 2 C, negative emissions, i.e. removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere that's already up there, are going to play a critical role. And compliance markets as they exist today don't really address that problem. They reduce ongoing emissions, but voluntary credits and the mechanisms that all of us here are building to fund scalable removals are going to be critical to achieving net zero, where you're balancing out the residual emissions after we've reduced as much as possible with negative emissions that actually draw down carbon from the atmosphere. Okay, excellent. And so back to the solutions, and Aurelien, yeah, you mentioned uh, that, um, I mean, blockchain and Web3, and actually that's why we are here, uh, can improve this. I mean, could you explain how the blockchain, maybe with more transparency and uh, decentralization, could improve this market? Yeah, so maybe 
I'll explain like with a concrete example of what we're doing like this you can see like the benefits of blockchain so at the very beginning when we started um, the, uh, the CEO, Fred, and I were working on a non-profit organization. So we were sending funds to reforestation projects, but we didn't really know the impact of all the money that we were sending. We were kind of lacking a reporting, and we were like, okay, there must be a way to increase the transparency, to also scale the funding uh, towards these like super cool projects. They were doing an amazing job, but it was kind of, we trusted the organizations, basically, uh, but we couldn't really see the impact. And so we wanted to truly increase the transparency, truly scale the funding, and we thought that to scale the funding, we needed like extreme transparency on what's happening on the ground, like a few thousand kilometers away from where you are. Um, and so then when we thought about it, we were like, okay, blockchain might be a very nice tool for this transparency and to be able also to reinvent like the economics behind like the funding of this project because a, lo a lot of funds go towards like consulting also and so on and so we wanted to reduce like the money that was lost in all the ecosystem to have the highest impact on the ground and so with blockchain concretely what we do is that the projects um, all their data is stored on chain and so if if you think about blockchain, it's a database, it's immutable, you cannot change the data that is stored and so on. And so you can have the history of the project that is easily accessible and public. And this data cannot be changed. So it's here forever, we see the evolution of the projects and you can check it out as an individual. So the key here was transparency for us. And then we also used blockchain because you can arrange with smart contracts um, a network of individuals that work together and that is like timed and so on. And so the validation of the data that is collected on the ground for us is done with a network of different validators. So multiple validators, which is very different from what is happening normally in the existing system where you just have one verification or validation. Um, and so here we have multiple entities, so with different skills that are checking the data and they can tell you, yes, it's a good data or no, something has really, really gone wrong here. And so it's, it's a way of organizing parties, of increasing transparency, and also of making the funding way more efficient. Um, you can go directly and have the greater impact with the funding that you send to the project. Okay, and it's very interesting. Do you have maybe one example of a project that you, you financed? Uh, um, so we're not directly fin financing projects on our own, but basically the projects are using our tools to show what's going on the ground, to measure the trees and so on. All this data is stored and all their funders, whether it's like uh, investors or donors, can see directly what's happening on the ground, how the trees are growing, uh, they can see satellite imagery also. Everything is super transparent. And so this transparency is very likely to increase the funding that goes to successful projects, to projects that um, get validated, that have high quality, high integrity, co-benefits and so on. So it's just like transparency and we believe that with more transparency, more funds will go to these projects and amazing organizations. And Guillaume, you, you, you have the same approach, right? Uh, yeah, in, in many, many, on many, many fronts, we, we, we share the same values, the same mission, uh, which is transparency, traceability, using actually blockchain for what it is, like the technology itself, the value it has, immutability, uh, transparency, traceability. That's, that's key. That's really what we and why we chose blockchain. So oh, everything you've said is we are uh, completely aligned. We also use blockchain on two fronts, I would say. Um, one is actually accessibility. The truth is, right now, the funding of those projects in general goes, you know, anywhere from a couple of hundred k to millions, hundreds of millions, even more sometimes, because those projects are like projects in general, nature-based projects. If we talk specifically of those, um, are costly, and they are costly not only because of the operational cost; they are also costly about like because of the certification, because of the auditing, because of all of this. So. This amount of money, what we, and this is how we actually started it at the very, very beginning before actually expanding the whole value life cycle. It was how do we make that available to anyone who wants to contribute, meaning individuals, meaning small companies, meaning like anyone can actually play and not have to have like one million dollar to put on the table right away. So what we did is we fragmented this investment into several investments. 
So instead of one million, it would be 1,000 or 10,000 by 100 or something like that. And so that way, anyone could actually contribute. So that's one of the uh, element also that is key in blockchain. And then um, I think what we are also, I think, uh, now uh, working on is really like the whole before a carbon credit becomes a carbon credit cycle, because this is where the biggest liquidity is, and this is big, where the actual real need is, in a way. We need more of those projects. If we look at um, numbers from IPCC, uh, UN, etc., we need at least, that's the bare minimum, to triple investments in such projects by 2030. Yes, so, 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 so we, which amount will it represent? Uh, I don't have the amount exactly, but this is like this, this huge amount, obviously. Like, uh, but the truth is, like, this is the bare minimum. If everything goes well and we reduce everything and civilization, we go all in line and we reduce everything, we need to at least triple them. It's not only about carbon, and that's maybe we will talk after, but I think this is important to mention. We, we talk about carbon all the way, but there are plenty of projects which are nature-based projects. They're, these projects are much more than just carbon absorption. They're biodiversity protection their livelihoods development. And I think what, what, what you guys are working on is also this, is actually to showcase not only you know, the quantity of carbon that has been absorbed or that will be absorbed, is also all the co-benefits that it creates because it provides more value to the investment. And so in short, we are now really focusing with the team on the whole you know, end-to-end -end life cycle from the very pre-financing of the project to the very end of the, 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 the issuance of the current credits and the retirement of those, how can we ensure that we keep all the way the right data at the right time and so that it, we, 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 we create sort of like the cleanest, uh, clearest tool for any corporations also to manage investments? Yeah, actually, it's, it's a really good question because we know that, okay, the blockchain can solve many problems, but not... I mean, the way that we put uh, the data on the blockchain. So, I mean, how you manage this and how to be sure that all the data on the blockchain are, from the beginning, the right one? Data provenance is a hard problem. Uh, the, the typical approach here is that you have multiple data streams that you can cross-reference with each other. And different methodologies will have different um, approaches to collecting and verifying that data. But I, I just want to circle back to something Orly said, that the existing systems are a good start. But I think it's worth emphasizing just how simple and, in my view, somewhat antiquated many of the systems used today for verifying this pro these projects are. In the last 30 years since carbon markets were first created, the technology stack hasn't changed that much. In the 90s, people were faxing and calling people on the phone, sending wire transfers from their banks. Nowadays, people email PDF documents, call each other on the phone, and send wire transfers from their banks. So there's a lot of opportunity on both the supply side, i.e. the way the projects are verified, uh, the way the data is collected, as well as on the demand side, how finance is delivered to the projects and how people make claims, corporations make claims using these credits. Uh, there's a lot of room for improvement. And up on the stage, we have a sort of um, representation from different aspects of that market. So at KlimaDAO, we're really focused on solving some of the demand side issues, making it easier to access these credits, having greater liquidity, so that the price of a given credit can be discovered more effectively. And then we have groups like Open Forest Protocol that are developing new methodologies for issuing carbon credits natively on chain using digital data like satellite data. Um, so it's important to understand that there's not sort of a silver bullet solution. There's a lot of different problems that exist in the current market that blockchain, some of which blockchain is an appropriate technology to solve. Um, yes, about, about that, um, we have to think well about what is that we're putting in the blockchain. Like, yeah, there is one carbon credit. And in theory, one carbon credit is one ton of, one ton of CO2, and it would be equal to another carbon credit of one ton of CO2. But we need also to have uh, some uh, security, some information. What is behind each of these carbon credits? Which project created them? Was it renewable energy? Is it just infrastructure? Is it uh, something helping people? Uh, how was the methodology applied? How, how sure are we that the benefits of the project are going to persist in time? 
How do we know that this project is not registered twice? So there are a lot of things to know behind the carbon credits that are already on the chain. Because the blockchain, if we see it from the part of the transactions and traceability, that's like the last part of it, like the use of it. But if we want to know what are we selling, we need to see also backwards uh, to the methodologies, to the technical side of things, to the, to the additionality of the projects, ecological additionality, that's also another issue that sometimes uh, represents a barrier for projects to be participating in carbon markets. Uh, actually, some small project developers cannot access the markets because uh, if it's a small scale and the fees are too high, they, they cannot just uh, pay for that. Um, so blockchain can also be part of some traceability during the methodology, uh, for example, in chain of custody for forest, um, uh, forest management projects. So uh, the wood that is being uh, used, where, where, uh, where is it being sourced? So that can be also an application of blockchain. Or for biochar projects, like every time the biochar changes hands, like in each part of the project, that can also be traced in blockchain. So. Now, not all of the processes in the carbon chain, in the carbon credit uh, chain, can be traced in blockchain. But uh, the idea is that it will become more and more uh, like end-to-end -end methodologies. And if we can add one point, because we were talking about data, because blockchain, all in all, is just a big database. Let's say if we sum it up. What we've decided is actually to tokenize the projects, because those are the ones that have all the metadata from which the carbon credits, the carbon contributions are going to come from. That's a very important point that you mentioned. Like one carbon credit is not equal to another. Like there is almost no chance that it is. Each carbon credit or each carbon contribution has a set of metadata, a, a big set of metadata. It includes localization, it includes typology of project. Is it a technical based project? Is it a nature based project? It includes, is it a removal project? Is it an avoidance project? It includes like a bunch. At Carbonable, we have, uh, if I'm not mistaken, 16 attributes, and, and I think the list goes on now because we will add more to define you know, what is a project and then what is what are the carbon credits coming from this project and so it's important to understand that yes indeed if you want to have current credits which are tradable fungible which means they're exactly the same they need to share all the attributes all the criteria and the truth is it can happen in only one moment when it is exactly same project and exactly same vintage it means like it's exactly like precisely the very same family of carbon credits. If not, they're semi-fungible because yes, indeed, they're the equivalent of one ton of CO2 absorbed or avoided, but you cannot exchange them directly because one, for example, would be an awesome project in Costa Rica, uh, you know, uh, that preserves some key biodiversity and helps livelihoods, etc. And you will have one which is done very poorly in one place of the world where uh, children are working on or not. So obviously, they don't have the same value and they're not the same, they cannot be considered the same. And so that's where also blockchain can provide this full transparency and traceability as to, okay, this is the metadata that has been stamped on the blockchain. You can go back to it at any time. And then you could question whether the, the original data was good. But at least like you have the, the track record up to the very moment this asset or this project was created. And do you think that we will have um, only one uh, carbon market? Uh, because we will keep maybe the, the, the traditional one. And also, we will have something uh, more on the Web3 infrastructure. I mean, how do you see the future on this? It's a really exciting time in the carbon markets right now. <laughs> There's a lot of change going on. What's clear is that since about a year and a half ago, when the on-chain carbon markets really picked up, um, there have been a bunch of projects building. But around a year and a half ago, the momentum started moving. And now, all of the major traditional carbon credit entities, including registries and standards bodies, you've heard the likes of Vera and Gold Standard mentioned, these are the market leaders. They issue about 90% between the two of them of all the carbon credits in circulation today. They have both held consultations on the role of blockchain technology in carbon markets. 
and they are moving relatively quickly for organizations of their, um, of their stature toward adopting blockchain technology into their own workflows as well as into the broader market infrastructure. So I expect that over the, next, over the coming years, we're seeing a lot of projects coming online that are using blockchain technology to address different aspects uh, of the market. And I think we'll also see adoption of this technology by traditional incumbents um, just because of the existing technology stack, as I said before, is, is quite antiquated and slow. And the scale of the market today is very small relative to the scale required for this market to have a meaningful impact on the climate crisis. The quotes from the uh, task force for scaling the voluntary carbon market are something like 15x uh, growth required by 2030 in terms of the tons uh, issued in order to have a meaningful impact on the, the race to net zero. Okay, and, and you, you talked about uh, supply and, and demand. I mean, the, um, the carbon market is, is driven by the supply or the demand today? If you ask different people, you'll get different answers. Um, my perspective is that the market is very uh, divergent right now. We have a huge amount of demand for credits that are available only in very limited supply. And we have a large amount of credits that are being issued by, um, by projects today that have fallen into disfavor. The, the media narrative has shifted, especially a few months ago, The Guardian released an article that lambasted a very popular methodology called Red Plus that, um, it, well, is one of the more cost-effective ways to avoid carbon emissions in that it involves protecting an existing forest from being deforested. Uh, but it's also a very difficult thing to measure and verify because you're trying to prove a counterfactual. You're saying this forest would have been cut down, but because we issued carbon credits and paid people to protect the forest, it wasn't cut down. And there were questions raised around how effective this methodology is at actually preventing emissions. Uh, I don't want to get into all the details of that here, but the point I want to emphasize is that the credits that are available today uh, and that can be issued to the tune of millions of tons uh, are very low in price, have been uh, disfavored by the market. And people are rushing toward very expensive credits that are available only in relatively limited supply right now. And that's created a supply squeeze at the high end of the market, pushing up prices for those, um, those projects that are considered more desirable today. Um, and so it becomes a question of cost versus scale. And it, we're seeing that evolve over time. So to answer your question, I, I worry that um, there's a lot of money going into these uh, removals, high-end removals that are very expensive to produce, um, and that if we get into a case where there are now millions and millions of tons of removals being issued at that higher price, that the demand that's currently present from corporations will be insufficient to absorb that supply. So one of the projects that we're working on at KlimaDAO is to bring in new demand. If the market's going to scale 15x, it's not just going to be from the same companies that have been sourcing carbon credits you know, for the last 10 or 20 years. We're going to need every organization, small businesses all the way up to giant enterprises, to be doing their part to, to drive demand for this asset. And actually, how do you onboard uh, those new companies, uh, not only the one that are, if you want to, I call it. Yeah, I, I mean, that's where, on the demand side, blockchain technology plays a really important role because in the traditional market, these trades are mostly over the counter, i.e. you call a broker on the phone, maybe you call a three or four of them to get different quotes, and then you settle the trade via email and wire transfer, and you get a PDF in your email that is like your proof that you did something to benefit the planet. Obviously, that mechanism is not going to scale, and the smaller the company is, or if it's even an individual like you or I offsetting our emissions from flying, um, there's, a, there's a need for greater access and less friction in that process of buying and retiring carbon credits, and blockchain can play a role in that process. <clears throat> Wait a moment, I lose the... <laughs> um, yeah, coming back to supply and demand. So, um, and back to the previous question, if, if it's a... Uh, it's a bit the wild, wild west. Like, it's so independent that there are cert accreditation standard, standard bodies uh, making carbon credits, how they think they're the best, way to do it, ethically or non-ethically, according to their own interest. And 
Mm, so the market leaders, as you say, Vera, Gold Standard, they were the pioneers and they shaped the market. They set up the rules and they set up rules that sometimes are driving also scarcity of credits because it's difficult to comply with them. And sometimes these rules are mostly administrative. Like we, we see, yeah, the, this project is certified by them and complies with all the papers, they have all the documentation, it's good. And then when, when someone researched on the projects, we found that 90% of the credits are ghost credits, they are not having the impact they should have. So these rules need to be changed. That's something that I think the REFI movement is now trying to do. And with increased transparency and with uh, more ethics, we are trying to prove that the projects can be traced, that you can really see where does it come from, and that also project developers can access the certification of their projects uh, easier, so they can uh, really be funded to continue developing projects and participate in this market, which will increase the, the supply as well. Okay, uh, we are more than 50 uh, in this room and I'm sure that people want to invest in this market, I mean to support projects. Uh, is it possible and how it's working? So right now you have probably a bunch of marketplaces um, that are proposing carbon credits from different types of projects where you can buy them. Um, you have Web2 based so non-blockchain, but also blockchain-based marketplaces. So as an individual, that would be the easiest, uh, checking out these marketplaces where you can buy carbon credits, like Klimadao, you could buy some carbon credits. Um, I don't know if you can buy as an individual right now. Yeah, you, yeah, you could. Work. Okay. So you could definitely like pre-finance also some carbon projects. Um, so yeah, as an individual, I would go to a marketplace. Uh, if you're a corporate, then you have different options. Uh, you can finance your own project eventually. Um, set up like a, a project with a planting organization. That's mostly what you would do. Or you could also buy credits, get in touch, um, as you said, over the counter for the moment. Uh, but in the future, you could use like new tools that we're building on blockchain where you can uh, go to auction houses and bid on credits that you would want to buy, get them directly, retire them on chain eventually in a, the split of a second without having to go through all this like uh, over the counter deals, contracts, and so on. Um, actually, that's that's the whole like that's as I said. I think that's really like the uh, the very idea that we that we pushed to get carbon ball going at the very beginning is how do we involve everyone in that fight? How do we make it available to anyone? And so that's why we focused on the supply itself. So providing more supply because more supply is needed, more quality supply is needed. So we focused on that, and it means that through Carbonable, we're going to do like a, a few public uh, project fundings in, a, in, in, in the next month and, and months with an S. So you're more than welcome to contribute. Like the first projects that we've actually uh, put uh, to fund were uh, sold out o almost instantly, which is obviously like a great sign. The idea is just to to explain like the, co the two key options that you have as a buyer for, as a company or as a buyer, to get carbon contributions. You either buy them once they're already audited, they've already been proved that they absorbed or avoided uh, the said quantity of carbon. So here you buy a carbon contribution like audited, or you can actually fund future of carbon credits. So future of carbon contributions. What it means, it means that you actually fund the project that will generate those carbon credits. The way it works is, let's say, I was a farmer. Like I take an example, the one that we had in uh, in, in, in in Panama. They had like a, a coast. The coast is being eroded. Uh, water is getting is getting is going to aff is affecting the coast. Actually, a church went down, etc. Because they removed uh, mangrove. Because at some point, mangrove was not seen as a cool thing, and re they removed it. They sold it, etc. Now they realize, okay, we need to actually restore nature here because it's bad for the fish, it's bad for the, st the, the coast, it's bad for everyone. So we actually need to restore this mangrove. The way it works is that there is a project developer that comes in that says, hey, to actually put it up and running, we need 
X amount. And then there is a certifier that will say, okay, if we certify this project, it's going to be Y amount. And all together, you know, it's going to be like such amount. And so what we do and what we make, what we streamline is, okay, come fund this project. And this project, once funded, is going to start. And as soon as it starts, carbon credits will get generated all over the lifetime of the projects. And those are called forward finance credits. And they become, over, over time, actually like uh, audited carbon credits. So th those are the two ways. And, and one simple way to take action on both climate fi uh, fighting and actually uh, potentially if you want to be exposed to the, the current market is, is, is taking part of those uh, funding opportunities. Yeah, Mark. Yeah, that's a great explanation of the two sort of modes. Um, you all may have also heard the term spot versus forward thrown around. A spot credit is, someone, is a credit that already exists. And I want to emphasize the different um, aspects. So like, what are the benefits of those two different modes of interacting with the carbon market? So the key benefit that especially many corporates and I think many individuals want to be able to make when they're interacting with this market is they want to say, I helped to you know, avoid or remove five tons of carbon dioxide, which compensates for you know, the estimated footprint from my travel to Paris, say. But if you're investing or putting money into a forward credit, you can't make that claim today because the project might fail. Uh, there might be a problem in the verification. They might deliver less credits than they originally planned. And so if you make a claim using the forward credit and then it turns out that the project had some problem, uh, your claim is called into question. And so generally the, the distinction is that if you want to make a claim today, you go to the spot market and you retire, i.e. destroy and make un unusable, a particular number of credits. If you want to fund a new project that hasn't happened yet, and you're willing to take the risk that that project won't deliver, you could put money into a forward arrangement, which would help net new climate action happen, but you can't make any claims today about you're supporting a specific number of tons being removed by a specific project because of the risk that that particular project may fail to deliver. OK, maybe the last question before uh, we have uh, this brainstorm together. Um, and it's for you, Alejandra. Uh, what's the next step? Uh, I mean, for the carbon markets, especially in the, the Web3 ecosystem. I mean, how can we um, switch from uh, yeah the traditional market to a more uh, blockchain uh, market on the carbon? Um, so there are certain things already happening. Um, for example, the World Bank has created the Climate uh, Action Data Trust. Trust, which is a meta registry, which is something really good, I think, because if there are independent certifying bodies and they have their own registry, which is good because decentralization is, is good, but at the end we need to be able to see all the projects that are happening at the same time, like in one place. I think that's really important. Because if not, how are we going to know if one project has been registered twice? Like only because we trust the people that is signing, saying yes, I'm not going to register it in another project, in another uh, certification. So I think that's one. Another um, part of the evolution of carbon markets, I think, is to be based on data. Absolutely, be, be based on data methodologies that use satellite images, remote sensors, Internet of Things, like things that can be like really there and to be replicable, the methodologies. Like you have the data that was uh, transmitted by a sensor, it's recorded hopefully on chain. If not, uh, if it's a satellite images, you can repeat the procedure. If it's coded like Google Earth Engine helps a lot or other things similar to that. So be based on data more than on trust because that's another part of the blockchain philosophy, like being trustless. So if we have uh, trustless in the methodology, we don't need to trust someone we can replicate that. So I think that's how I see it. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so we can continue uh, the discussion. And thank you uh, to all of you.